once there was a Stone Age, a Bronze Age, and now we are in the middle of the Plastic Age. Because every year we produce about 300 million tons of plastic, and a fraction of that enters rivers, waterways, and eventually the oceans. Because if we want to eat um, biscuits nowadays, we have to buy a biscuit within a plastic wrapper, within a plastic tray, within a cardboard box, within some plastic foil, within a plastic bag. It's not hazardous nuclear waste, it's a biscuit. <laughs> and, well, this is me. I love diving, just uh, taking you through my holiday slides here. Uh, this is at the pristine Azores Islands, so shock. Um, but this is how their beaches look, completely covered in these plastic fragments. Because over the years, due to sun and waves, the plastic breaks down into ever smaller pieces, but remains plastic. And interestingly, you don't see a lot of red particles in here, because those look like food to birds more than any other color. The debris primarily collects at these five rotating currents called the gyres, where it doesn't only directly kill sea life, but due to the absorbance of PCBs and DDTs, also poisons the food chain. A food chain that includes us, humans. And so while well, diving in Greece, I actually came across more plastic bags than fish. And astounded by the depressing sight, my Scottish dive buddy turned to me and said something like, uh, lots of jellyfishes here, they've seen about a thousand. Well, there were no jellyfishes. Solving this problem will require radical changes in the individual corporate and governmental levels of society. We need to close the tap first and prevent any more plastic from entering the oceans in the first place. But there won't be a solution to the plastics already trapped in the currents of the gyres. So why don't we just clean it up? Well, we would need to deal with uh, five colossal areas, each millions of square kilometers. Furthermore, these areas rotate, so the plastic does not stay in one spot. We would need to deal with plastic sizes ranging from these massive ghost nets all the way down to microscopically sized particles. Furthermore, the cleanup shouldn't have any other negative environmental impacts like bycatch or emissions. Getting all the plastic back to land would be an immense logistical challenge. Furthermore, we need to be financially realistic, of course, and is, in fact, the total amount of plastic within the gyres unknown. So I'll simply use this list of concerns as challenges. And, in fact, a week later, as a school assignment, I had the chance to spend a lot of time on a subject of choice together with a friend of mine. And this gave me the perfect opportunity to perform new and fundamental research regarding plastic pollution and get to know the problem really well. Um, and I then went on holiday to Greece, taking, um, let's see, this Mentatrol with me, which is the common device for sampling plastic. And so I had to leave home all my clothes due to low-cost airline weight limit policies. It took four days behind the microscope. And then in November of that year, we also did some sampling in the North Sea. Um, I thought it was a great day. We did some plankton testing. Uh, here you can see the net. Oh, we didn't have a boat, so um, that's, that's the friend. Uh, we're still great friends, by the way. Uh, and um, furthermore, we tried measuring up to what depth the ocean surface should be cleaned. Uh, though, unfortunately, the trawl we built uh, broke. But, of course, we didn't quit there and continued by calculating approximately how much plastic there is in the top layers of the oceans. The result? A 
a whopping 7.25 million tons of plastic in 2020. That's the weight of a thousand Eiffel Towers floating in the Gyres. And okay, then I successfully finished a school assignment, but I really couldn't stop thinking about the problem. And in the meantime, I started studying aerospace engineering, so I thought, well, why not combine my passions for technology and the environment to help contribute to a solution of this global issue? Because, so, I started working out a dangerous idea of mine. Because not too long ago, it has been estimated it would take over 79,000 years to clean up just a single gyre. However, I believe the Great Pacific Garbage Patch can completely clean itself in just five years. And that's the difference of 78,995 years, by the way. So, um, so well, this is the conventional idea of extracting litter, right? So you just take a, a vessel and a net and you start fishing for plastic. Or you could use many vessels to cover a larger area, but by spanning floating barriers between those vessels, suddenly a much larger area would be covered because the essence is not to catch the debris, but divert it. Because there is no mesh size, we can even get out the smallest particles. And virtually all of the current would flow underneath the booms, taking all neutrally buoyant things with it, which means sea life would not accumulate along these barriers, preventing bycatch. But how do we minimize uh, environmental, financial, and transportation costs. Well, let's use our enemy to our advantage, okay? Because what if the oceanic currents moving around wouldn't be an obstacle, but a solution? Why move through the oceans if the oceans can move through you? By fixing platforms to the seabed and letting the rotating currents do their work, vast amounts of funds, manpower, and emissions will be saved. So the basic concept is that extremely long floating barriers concentrate the plastic towards platforms. Arriving inside the platforms, the plastic can be filtered out in multiple stages, can, st can then be stored in barges, and can be taken to land for processing about three or four times per year. But I, you, might, you might be wondering, how on earth are we going to fund this? Well, plastic pollution is a major economic burden to all countries in the world. For example, the cost to vessels and fishing activities in the APEC region has been estimated to be over 1.2 billion US dollars annually. And furthermore, the costs of the cleanup of beaches in California has been estimated to be over 500 million US dollars per year. But no, the awesome surprise for me was that if we recycle the plastics retrieved from these five gyres into either energy, oil, or new materials, it's in theory even possible to cover the costs of the execution. But I believe that only if we realize change is more important than money, money will come. And um, it, it did, actually. Um, after, after um, in April this year, the concept went viral on the internet and received about a thousand emails per day of people offering their help. Uh, we quickly started a crowdfunding campaign and reached our eighty thousand uh, dollar target in just fourteen days. And oh, well, thank you. 
And then a month later, we quickly assembled a team of over 50 people with whom we're currently performing an extensive feasibility study, which is scheduled for completion in spring of 2014. Uh, not again, please. Uh, and um, so far, we've done uh, plastic quality analysis, we've done scale model tests, and we've done lots of force calculations. And in a few days' time, I'll be leaving for Bermuda, where in the North Pacific Gyre, or North Atlantic Gyre, I'm sorry, we'll for the first time finally be able to measure up to which depth the ocean surface should be cleaned. And yes, the ocean cleanup will be the largest cleanup in history. But we created this mess. Heck, we, we even invented this new material first before we made this mess. So please, don't tell me we can't clean up this mess together. Thank you very much. So I just had a quick question. I know that Jack discussed in his talk that not everything went perfectly always. I'd love to hear about any adversities, any challenges that you faced along the way. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, it took quite some time to, to get here. I mean, um, I did my first presentation on the topic uh, exactly one year ago. And then I spent the next four months talking with many professors and industry experts, identifying all the problems um, uh, and to see which questions should be answered in this feasibility study. And then I thought it was pretty great, uh, going pretty well. I had 3,000 views on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, and then I decided to quit my, uh, quit my education temporarily. Uh, and so then I, I, I didn't have, uh, I, I wasn't studying. Um, I didn't have a social life because I, I quit that. Uh, I, uh, we didn't have any people, we didn't have any money. Desperately, I, I, I tr I, we emailed about 300, 300 companies uh, for sponsoring and actually none replied. So oh I, I suppose Jack, Jack didn't do too bad with the one on, one, one on 200. I would be satisfied with that. <laughs> um, uh, but then, yeah, finally in, in April, the, the work paid off, and then we finally got the resource, uh, resources to do the research. Um, yeah, and it's going great. Yeah. Does that make you appreciate the success more now, the fact that there was so much adversity? Yeah, I, I, in fact, um, I, w I wasn't really, I've never been really fond of crowdfunding, uh, to be honest. I, I wasn't really fond on going into the media. We didn't go into the media. Um, because um, I, it's something what I call the inventor's dilemma. You can either keep the, the idea quiet and just, you know, be busy with it after 15 years and um, be practically useless. Uh, but what you could also do is make, you know, make a website, do a talk, and then hope you just get enough resources to get to the next step. Mm -hmm. and, but that's with the risk that it suddenly goes viral on the internet and you're being attacked that you're going into the media because it's just an idea. So um, that, that was pretty difficult at the start, but, um, but then, I mean, we had some exposure, so I thought, well, let's make the, the most of it, and we did a crowdfunding campaign, and yeah, it paid off. Awesome, and we're glad that Thanks. it did. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <It's the mo> <laughs> well, Another question I had for you is if you could tell something to, to other young people, other students that don't want school to interfere with their education, like students, young people that want to take on projects by this by themselves and just go ahead and tackle environmental problems or political problems whenever they can and because they feel it's the right thing to do, what, what advice would you give them? Uh, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but how can we make it easier so you're not the exception? So it's it's the norm that everyone wants to, that the education system gives us an incentive to try to do things like this, to try to take on projects by our own. Um, well, I, I, more freedom in education would certainly help. I mean, now um, 
I think education is sort of um, a method to get to your goal, and if you get the chance to uh, get to your goal in a much quicker way, um, you should embrace it, I think. Um, though, unfortunately, uh, well, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we, we only got 80 hours for the research uh, study, which I did in the last grade of my secondary year, mm -hmm. and we spent over 800 on it. So I think um, if just just give the, the students 800 hours and uh, see what they come up with. That would help. Thank you. Thank you. There is a lot of plastic in the oceans. It's scary, guys. Over. Our research found that there is about 80 million kilos of, of plastic floating around. Even though by count, most of these pieces of plastic are small, if you look at it from a mass perspective, actually most of the debris is large. And we see that about 92% of the plastic isn't microplastic, but is large plastic. Because when you think about it, those 8% of plastic that are already microplastics, they used to be large objects as well, but because of UV lights, it breaks down into these smaller and smaller pieces, becoming harder to clean up and magnifying the impact of the problem. 